Hey everyone and welcome to a very special Digital Foundry Direct and uh, we're in Berlin, the home of Alex Battaglia. We're all guests uh, in Germany <laughs> here and uh, joining us, a very special guest, Tom Peterson from Intel. Hello. I almost said from NVIDIA. Though. No, God, no, God, no. no. <laughs> That's okay. We all have paths. We all have paths. Thanks so much for joining us here. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you about the new arrival of Intel Arc. It's happening, right? It's, it is it's for sure happening. happening. It is. Okay. So the last time we spoke about Arc, it was literally just, well, just over a year ago, wow. right? Which is, is right? quite a phenomenal oh amount of time to have passed. Has passed. <laughs> the question is, um, at the time, the projected release date for Arc was Q1 this year? I don't recall exactly, but I wouldn't be surprised. There, there, there have been subsequent queues. There have been. There have been. <laughs> and it's, it's, not, it's not great. I'll, I'll just be uh, frank, Richard. You know, to me, all these projections are an art. And as managers, we always do the best we can to reflect accurately where we think we're going to land this product. We don't want to be too aggressive, we don't, but we, we don't want to be too conservative. And really, we did think it was going to be Q1. But the truth is, we've learned so much. And really, the biggest challenge we've had has been game compatibility. There's thousands and thousands of titles that games and people play. Okay. And as we've worked through Arc, getting more and more healthy and running more and more titles, we just made a hard choice that said, we got to wait until this is ready. And okay. that, that has taken us uh, you know, at least um, several many months longer than originally expected. Mm -hmm. So there have been sort of supply uh, side constraints, but it's not a manufacturing issue. It's, it's essentially an experience issue. I think so. I, I mean, it is true that earlier there were some supply side things that uh, added into the delay, but I would say most of our, our delay comes from primarily readiness and making sure that when we launch these devices that we can give great experiences to our customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, which leads us on to the next question, because obviously the way a GPU is, has been released and marketed it's been sort of set in stone for quite some time. You would, you would start at the top of the stack <laughs> and generally work down. Yes. And, you know, call me crazy, but typically reviewers get given samples to review. Yes. Out of nowhere, we've, we discover that the A380, which is at the lower end of the stack, is going to be coming out in China. Yes. And there's no seeding to reviewers for sampling. Yes. But there is support of a sort in terms of drivers and a review guide. I don't understand how this came about. It's, yeah. It must be a very bizarre set of circumstances. It, it's, it's hard to explain in hindsight because it, went, it, it did not go as we expected, obviously. Our, our initial thinking was pretty straightforward. We wanted to try to minimize the sort of exposure of the original GPU launch and A380 was ready first. So we right. thought through how can we start getting feedback from end users without uh, kind of exposing the entire world at, all at once. And it kind of made a little bit of sense. We also did system builders first before we did the channel. And again, trying to control the number of platforms and kind of keep <laughs> things small. But the, the actual truth is that there is an internet and there is global shipping and anything that you do in one country is going to go everywhere. And that's probably predictor, uh, predictable a priori. But uh, nevertheless, we had a good intent but it didn't really go well because honestly, we were not ready for A380 to be reviewed globally. And, right. and with the amount of scrutiny that was applied to it, I felt bad that we had not really understood where we were from a driver readiness perspective. So on the one hand, it's good, right? Because we got early feedback that we may not have otherwise gotten. Uh, and it helped us really refocus and fix bugs that needed to get fixed before we launched our, our bigger GPUs. Right, because from my perspective, this has been quite interesting and challenging because on the one hand, I want to tell users what to expect from a new player in the mm -hmm. GPU market. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's clear that the product on the, the software stack side certainly is still a work in progress. And maybe you didn't give the cards for that reason. Uh, I would say that uh, we've learned a lot. That's the, right. that's the best way to summarize it. I do feel very comfortable with where we are today. Right. And uh, A750 and A770, I think you're going to find that the entire review cycle is going to be much more traditional. I mean, it is true we're taking a slightly different approach to launch. We're not having a, a giant editor's day where we bring everybody in. And instead, you know, we're talking directly to both press and our customers 
educating people about what's this A380, I'm sorry, A750 and 770 all about. And I think that's, that's so far going pretty well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that now, actually. We've got the stack. You've, you've given a broad outline of the way the stack works. We know it's at the bottom end, the yep. A380. At the top end, there's the 750 and the 770, yep. um, which are using two different dies. Yep. What we're not talking about today in any real depth is the, the middle of the stack. Exactly. Right? That, there'll come a time for that. Okay. So, so I say, here we are today, let's focus on what's real, and that's going to be the A750 and A770. But the truth is, there is this whole middle of the, of the road between our, uh, our A11 and A10 die that we haven't talked about, which is the 5 series. Okay. And how does that work? So essentially, it is similar to I3, I5, I7, where 3 is your ent entry level. Yep. Five mainstream, seven at the higher end. Exactly, right? exactly. And that, that's going to be consistent, I expect, for the for the lifetime of, of ARC graphics, right? We're just kind of setting the framework that we'll be able to iterate uh, as we go forward. Mm -hmm. So you, you've released benchmarks, internal benchmarks for the 750. Yep. And you've, I think you've also talked about, they come from the same die. Yep. It's the, the Alchemist G10. Yep. And it's 28 execution units versus 32, right? I believe so. Okay. Uh, XC cores. XC cores. XC cores. Yeah, That's no, sort no, of like no. our compute, okay. right? And inside of XC cores, there's the uh, matrix engines and the vector engines, and that's where all the compute comes from. Because at the moment, you know, obviously the, the bulk of the coverage has been on the A380, which maxes out at eight. Yeah. So 32 is essentially, oh, 28 much bigger, Yeah, much bigger. Is essentially an entirely different power bracket. It is, and, and think of it as the software balancing is entirely different. The CPU, GPU balance would just be completely different. The question that a lot of people will be asking is, um, I mean, you've made a lot of powerful statements, I would say, about price versus performance. Powerful? Well, <laughs> I mean, it, it, we're in an interesting situation now at the moment where actually GPU prices generally post crypto are collapsing. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a dynamic landscape. Very out, dynamic. It? How are you gonna price it basically? I mean, I think I saw on the Linus video that you had three tiers of performance. I mean, you've been quite open that DX11 is a work in progress. Yep. Some titles are good, some not so good. Yep. And then you've got your Vulcan and DX12, which generally work well. And then you've got, I think, your power titles like Cyberpunk. That work really well. Which are, you know, are I'll call it working as designed. <laughs> working yeah, as designed. Yeah, okay. like for the hardware, right? And that's, that's, the real, that's the real difficulty that we're working through. We built very powerful hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we get a title and a driver that's well aligned with that, we're going to get, you know, great performance, you know, far above 3060. But the problem is that's not the case for every title. It's not the case for every API, and so we have to help our our customers and press understand that up front. We're not we're not trying to you know pull the wool over anybody's eyes. We're saying, listen, there's places that we are highly optimized, but our engine is built for being highly optimized, and over time you'll see our driver improving every generation mm -hmm. or every every month as we do our day zero drivers. So if you had to split up these titles, if I just may butt in here really quickly. Uh, <laughs> if you had to split up these titles, because you have your DX12 that are really good that you've optimized for, but you have your DX12 not so good, and then DX11, which is you've been written a DX11 driver to spec. Like what is exactly the difference between games which makes them run better or worse on Arc by default without mm. driver optimizations? Well, there's lots of things there. I mean, that's a very complex question because yeah. our microarchitecture is very different from, say, NVIDIA's microarchitecture. And that means that certain instruction sequences that might be part of the uh, DX11 or DX12 spec, those instructions are highly optimized sequences that run very well on NVIDIA, but yet on our microarchitecture, they may not be fully pipelined well or they may not scale appropriately in SIMD with mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So all of that um, is complicated in DX11, where the driver actually has to do a lot of work to scale between the game and the hardware. Think of it as like thick. Mm -hmm. On DX12, it's easier because the game engine itself is doing a lot of the resource management. And that means that there's less stuff in the way in terms of the driver or windows between the hardware and the game. Mm -hmm. So that's why you'll see, in general, better performance on DX12 and in general, more work to be done on DX11. We're working through decades of kind of like quirkiness in mm -hmm. game engines and games. Yeah, so like I think also for your architecture, it's very interesting because 
AMD and NVIDIA for a long time now, are, especially with RDNA 2, have like 32 lanes essentially, uh, or 64 as it was on GCN, but you are working on eight, right? Yes. So it doesn't map necessarily it does as not cleanly. Map. It does not map does not as map. cleanly, yeah. Yeah, so that's one other, it's more forward looking, I would say, from the path tracing perspective, uh, but going backwards in time to, to titles that did not exist, I can imagine that's a challenge. There's, there's gonna be a lot of those kind of things. And, mm -hmm. and the way to think about it is, the amount of work to enter the GPU business is un, unfathomable. It's very, you know, it's, as, you, as you know, it's just like an it's an it's an awe-inspiring task. I'm not I'm not. I'm, it sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. So you got to build a GPU, which is by itself a feat of science that's mm -hmm. incredible. But also the driver stack that works across thousands of games that have been developed over decades. That's a that's a task that's not going to work for most people. So I'd say that Intel is probably the only near-term third GPU vendor that's viable. And I can tell you that for us, this is not just a one-year, five-year, 10-year effort. This is something that's gonna be continuing for a long time. And every generation, we're gonna work through new things that we didn't figure out. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna get more and more uh, towards the end of the design where we intended. Okay. There's, a, there's a certain degree of forward-looking nature in general in the design right yeah and another weakness that has been identified resizable bar yeah. which is essentially that it, it's an essential element you've got to yes it, really you do because you know some of the benchmarks we saw you can be dropping like 40 percent performance with rebar off and yeah. this is related just to make things clear rebar essentially is um uh, I guess widening the interface between the CPU and GPU memory. Yeah, right? it's, it's a PCI spec uh, thing. It's an optional part of PCI spec, but it's supported by all modern processors. I think for us it's Gen 10 and later, and AMD, I, do, I don't know the exact number on AMD, but it's most of them. Yeah. Most of it. And what it does is it lets the CPU write bigger bursts to the GPU memory. Mm -hmm. And by writing bigger bursts to the GPU memory for things like texture loading or shader loading or anything where the CPU is loading up the GPU like on a scene change, that makes our memory controller behave much more efficiently. So that's different from other people who've designed memory controllers that work better with smaller bursts. We need big bursts to perform well. Mm -hmm. The obvious question would be, you know, I'd say the majority of PCs out there, the legacy PCs obviously don't have this support. Yep. So why did you design a memory controller that, that requires it? I think it's a tuning thing over time. Uh, I think if we were aware when we started, when we made these memory controller decisions, how sensitive this would leave us to a rebar, we may have rethought it. But this is part of the learning process, right? As we, as we are optimizing, we're thinking, hey, wouldn't it be better if we made big bursts highly efficient? And that, you know, if you're sitting in an architecture meeting and that somebody says, you go, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Well, you know, it turns out that down the pipe, you find out, well, maybe it'd be better if we're a little less efficient, but we handle more different varied size transactions a little better. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all part of this uh, heavy lift that we have to do as a company to, you know, build a discrete GPU that's competitive and it's going to be an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess we should talk about some of the, again, the more forward looking features that, mm -hmm. are, that are built into the architecture sure. here. Uh, where do you want to start? XESS or ray tracing? Oh, this one's hard. Um, well, <laughs> uh, spoiler, we do actually have some hands-on with XESS that will be coming out at some point in time. Uh, but I want to leave that off to the side uh, first before I get into some questions about it, but rather kind of talking about ray tracing. Uh, at the moment, currently, uh, this is one of the problems I think with the reviews regarding the architecture is that uh, since you guys launched with A380 first, it's hard to get a grasp exactly about how hardware efficient it is yeah. in regards to ray tracing because an A380 as a GPU is probably not one you'd be turning you, you, all the ray tracing on. You would not be turning ray tracing on. You probably are not yeah. doing that. So I guess why as an architecture focus on that in the first place with your first gen at all? Like, oh, why include ray tracing? Why, well, why make it like such a premier part of the design of the GPU, ah, right? Because like your first, because your first gen when it's launching, ray tracing titles aren't necessarily they're not the you know every single title out yeah. there. A lot of why, people. Why are, include that as part of the first bucket? Yeah. Why yeah. why take on this extra uh, weight? I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I do know. It's, it's right. because <laughs> ray tracing is one of those technologies that uh, I believe strongly in, and I think all of us at Intel do because it's it's the next frontier of graphical quality. Mm -hmm. I hope you're going to do some deep dives into how this ray tracing stuff looks, but for me, it's just 
it's a natural evolution of graphics and we don't want to be forever like uh, tier two graphics, mm -hmm. right? Our, our ambition is not to be the second best graphics, right? Over time, we want to become the best. And the reason, uh, the, the way you do that is you just push yourself. Mm -hmm. And ray tracing and XCSS, maybe AV1 encoding, these premier technologies are hard to do. Um, but for us, doing them now means that we'll build the, those muscles. And as we move forward from generation to generation, uh, we'll be ready to continue to differentiate. So I'm especially excited about the ray tracing hardware development that we've done and the X XCSS implementation. Both of them are best in class, I think. And you're, you're going to test all this out, but uh, I'm pretty excited. It is a question, though. Could we have gotten earlier done? Could we have been in the market last year? Could we have been? There's lots of could We, I, I guess it's impossible for us to answer. Mm -hmm. We chose to take that big bite. And uh, it's taken a little while to chew it down, and, and, but now we're, now we're getting out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, just some other ray tracing questions because technically you could watch a GDC presentation on this from like Holger Grün. Like, you know, there's a lot of things you can Holger watch out there. Genius. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, um, you know, so AMD came to the market um, with RDNA 2, which was their first ray tracing supporting GPU, hardware ray tracing. It kept the ray tracing acceleration rather light. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA, we've covered in the past that they do a bit more. What exactly is it about ARC actually that makes it more ray tracing performant? That you, you would say put it, because you said first in class. Yeah, I think like it you is. have to ground that. Well, we're, gonna, we're putting out a video in a couple of days. Maybe it's out by the time this comes out. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it is? Likely. Likely? Likely? Yes. Okay. If, if that's the case, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to tell you about <laughs> two technology that we talk about in that undisclosed <laughs> video. One is a BVH cache that's mm -hmm. available, and the other one is a thread sorting unit. Mm -hmm. Now, the combination of these two technologies. Uh, makes, uh, let's call it delivered ray tracing rates. Because mm -hmm. you can have all these big peak numbers that come from having lots of, you know, kind of ray tracing hardwares, but the peak numbers don't deliver real ray tracings mm -hmm. because you can be inefficient about how you shade later on once you detect your thread hits. So I would say that we've built the right balance of real uh, traversal hardware backed up by acceleration structures like a BBH caching that should deliver real ray rates. That's mm -hmm. what that's my story. You can see watch the video, a little plug for the video, watch the video. But uh, but we do do a little bit of deeper dive on that technology. It's awesome. all about the giga rays. <laughs> giga rays. Giga rays why? Well, why? I, I I guess the deal about that is that yeah, uh, if you put out a number of like peak uh, triangle hits or something like that, yeah. or even giga rays that it's not necessarily describing in a real ray tracing scene what if you have pass. Yeah, like is the hardware actually being utilized to its fullest, which is actually the biggest problem. Yeah. Right and I, I feel like that's a great area uh, maybe you guys can help with. How should we start uh, uh, like uh, authentically characterizing ray tracing performance? Because it's very scene dependent, it's, it's algorithm dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, how, ma how many rays can I cast per ray tracing unit? But again, it's, it's, it's more difficult because depending on the scene, you might get good reuse of some caching structures, you might get good use of some thread sorting depending on the materials. So it's a very complex question. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of why I'm looking at people like 3D Mark or independent benchmarkers to start helping us get some structure around what's the right way to benchmark ray tracing. Mm -hmm. What we need is a bar chart. A bar chart, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, that's what I was More. thinking, Richard. A bar chart. <laughs> Oh, okay, so ray tracing. I think we, I think we've covered that some yeah. uh, as much as we realistically can. Um, so let's scroll back one year. We we were sitting here on August twenty fourth, uh, or that's when it was posted. But sat down with you and Lisa, talked about the architecture beforehand. Uh, back at that point in time, we had FSR one point zero on the market. Uh, DLSS in its more advanced form, uh, FSR two point zero hadn't come into existence then. Okay, so. But scroll forward one year, <laughs> FSR 2.0 is out, we see what I would consider a competitor to you know, DLSS, which is an AI-based upscaler mm -hmm. uh, reconstruction technique. What exactly does XESS bring to the market this, at this point in time? Honestly, like where you already have two semi-proven solutions or proven solutions, mm -hmm. what's, what's the point of a third? Like mm -hmm. why, why have Intel here? Well, um, from, from my perspective, each of the vendors like AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA are gonna provide their own optimized uh, upscaling technology. 
it's, it's, a, it's another area of competition that's just emerging right now. And, and the idea is when you have a certain amount of GPU power, rather than spending all of that power on render, you want to say, I'll render smaller and then do some other algorithm to make it bigger. And that other algorithm is this area of competition. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what does XCSS bring versus FSR and XCSS, or I'm sorry, FSR and DLSS, I'll let you <laughs> comment on that quality, okay? Because you're much more equipped to be like do doing the detail stuff there. But from my perspective, it's just our approach to this, what is that other algorithm? It's going to be optimized for Intel using our XMX instructions and writing these finely you know, crafted kernels that our team is doing to get the best performance. Mm -hmm. But we're also making it open. XCSS is open to run on other vendors' hardware, um, and that's up to the ISV. So at the end of the day, um, I don't think we're going to, you know, kick out DLSS from Intel titles. I'm sorry, from NVIDIA titles. Yeah. We're probably not going to kick out FSR from uh, AMD titles initially. But over time, it's just this is a new area of competition. All right, all right. So you talked about DP4A running on competitor GPUs, but also in the video that you recently put out, you did mention how it's running on integrated graphics yep. and things like that using DP4A. That I'm super excited about. Okay, so that's one thing that we haven't seen yet yes. at all. So yes. be, I'm very curious about the performance numbers oh there. Oh my gosh, course. that is gonna be so good. I can't talk about it yet because obviously it's not released, but DP4A, uh, and let's just talk about where XCSS does a good job. Mm -hmm. When you have a very long render time, uh, relative to the post-processing, which is like integrated graphics, then you can cut that render time way down by going to a smaller resolution and then using a sort of an upscaling technology uh, on those devices. So I think you're going to find on integrated that uh, I would expect XCSS to, does very well. Very similar to those charts we showed you about mm -hmm. long render times is the sweet spot for XCSS. Okay, so, but in terms of the DP4A path, um, Every game that sh ships XCSS will also offer a DP4A path? I think that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, think it, that's inside uh, of our SDK, uh, mm -hmm. although we should ask for the validation from the, uh, from the team on XCSS. Do you think that's true? Well, the question is, will every title that ships with XCSS support both XMX and DP4A? And I, I think the answer is true, but we're going to check on that. Yeah, well, that should be something we should check in maybe. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, mind track. Um, how do we integrate that into the video now? Uh, well, the reason why I'm asking is because you mentioned that it'll run on competitors' GPUs, and it's it's interesting if XCSS comes out and all of a sudden everyone else can use it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, I, why would we do such a thing, you might be asking. Yeah, well, well it's, it's, yeah, why why do that to, um, I don't know how to integrate that into the video that responds to that. <laughs> <laughs> which which one? Uh, Are we well, going to be doing a blooper reel? Yeah, blooper yeah, reel at this point. How do totally we do this? Fine. I think it's I totally think, fine as is. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Off, think, off screen. I think the, the, the question is, is from my perspective, what is the end game here? Does you know, we saw first of all, you know, first of all, for example, there was G Sync, yeah. then there was Free Sync. Right. The end game is some kind of merging. You know, G Sync compatible is you know, is are we looking at you know three or four years down the road? Why do we have three different competing solutions? Yeah, for upselling. Is it, yeah, is the end point going to be some kind of um, merging slash integration, and yeah. typically the more open solution wins out? Mm, uh, so I, I, that's a, that's a great question, Richard. So my my personal view, which is not we are not of one mind at Intel on this because we have lots of big minds and we all have different thoughts. <laughs> My mind, since I get to talk about my mind. <laughs> it's like no yeah, it's, a, it's not fair. Nobody, everybody doesn't get to say this. But so my mind says the best answer is Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what, we, what I would love Microsoft to do, and we're already working down this path, is to standardize it. And, and they would standardize it for the game developer to say, hey, Mr. Game Developer, uh, here's a standard way of checking to see if there's an upscaling technology available for your platform mm -hmm. and what the options are and how to visualize it. And then here's a standard way for you, Mr. Game Developer, to access that engine, right? And, and that's, that's definitely not impossible to do. NVIDIA's got an effort that they're working on creating an open standard for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we're working both with NVIDIA and with Microsoft to try to standardize that. And there's a third path, maybe it's just open and everybody converges to some open standard. I still think there's going to be per vendor optimizations and per vendor innovation that will prevent it from being a completely, you know, common uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is make APIs for games such that there can be innovation 
that doesn't require game engine uh, reintegration. Kind of like the DXR spec. Kind of like DXR. Yeah, that's right. a lot really like DXR. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the way I would also probably want it to happen in the end because otherwise, just plugging into yeah. one thing. Absolutely. Think about just, DX11, DX12, DX9. Yeah. Why does DX work? It's because there's there's an API that's standard for game engines, mm -hmm. and and it doesn't have to know that there's different drivers, different GPUs. Moving on to some more XESS questions here. You talked about NVIDIA doing their own thing. They're innovating in their own way. XCSS is going to be doing the same thing too. But one thing that I found very compelling about DLSS was it's the way it plugs in with a DLL, like mm -hmm. a dynamic link library file. You can just drag and drop anyone you want into a game usually, and you can see differences based upon the version of DLSS. Yeah. XESS, how's the model work there? Is there, is there versioning like that too? Uh, the whole question, well, there's a, there, this is a very good question because game engine or game developers have sort of a vested interest to know basically what's the experience that they're shipping with. Yeah. So they would like, uh, or we've heard some feedback that says, hey, I, I, I don't want you to update uh, the way this works under the covers without me knowing. Because mm -hmm. we could do that, right? We could make XCSS just part of the driver. And every time the driver updates, you get a new version and game behavior will change. So we have a hybrid model where similar to DLSS, if you take the DLL and you put it in the game install directory, which happens by default when a game ships, then you're gonna have a stable version of, of the effect. If, however, you're a game developer and you don't put that in your distribution, then you're gonna get the version that's shipping with the driver. That's interesting. And effectively, you will be upgraded dynamically as uh, we upgrade our DLL. So I think there's gonna be a mix, and, and uh, as this becomes known, you might even see some users, or power users, or reviewers, <laughs> start to dork around with this stuff on their own, but yeah. Right. The intention is to be somewhat more transparent. Because the, the DLL model has seen FSR patches added to DLSS games. Which oh, is, is that right? That's yeah, interesting. It's a kind of bizarre yeah, use case. Yeah. People hijacking the inputs and dragging FSR to DLLs into DLSS games. No kidding. I had, I had not heard that. I would honestly not be surprised if uh, XCSS could almost do something similar. I don't know. I mean, I would. I don't that know. sounds about like something someone I, I have to check on that. That'd be very interesting. <laughs> um, all right. So another XCSS question here, semi-related to that. It's about user control over it. You have obviously your resolutions, your internal resolutions labeled as performance, quality, ultra quality and balanced. Uh, but one thing that we've seen in the past that's evolved over time is that titles would initially ship with just a certain level of sharpness to the result. Yes. There. Okay, and a lot of people would maybe like it, some people wouldn't. Um, and there's always been a push now for, so that DLSS 2.0 plus and FSR 2.0 ship with sharpening sliders mm -hmm. to control that level for the user. Well, how does XCSS do this right uh, now? Right, you know, I'm not 100% sure of that answer. We don't have a sharpening slider that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. but it's such a good question. I've already asked the development team to comment on that, and I would not be surprised if that's something we are looking at right now. Although, I, I don't honestly know that that's work that's been done, but it makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. cool. I've got a question about the DP4A path, which is sure. fundamentally, um, the performance isn't there compared to your matrix right. multiplication engines, but is the footprint of, um, of XCSS low enough to still be performant on DP4A? Oh, I yeah. guess it has to be if yeah. you're work, working on integrated graphics, yeah. right? Think of it as relative to integrated graphics, what is the impact of DP4A, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty dramatic because it's much more power efficient than render. Right, yeah. okay. And that would extend also to, I mean, there's a, Everybody is looking at the, the competing uh, GPUs out there, the classic ones, the 1060, the 580. Mm -hmm. Does this have mm -hmm. DP4A support? Does this not have DP4A support? Yeah. If it does, is XESS actually going to be usable on this GPU? Yeah, Will I actually see a performance gain? Uh, it's very hard to know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> because really, I'm focused primarily on Intel GPUs. <laughs> Really? But yeah, yeah. That's, that, that just happens to be where my head's at. Uh, but I can I can tell you that it's definitely open. It's definitely possible. It's based on open standard shader models, mm -hmm. and anybody who wants to can take that and run it on a, a discrete or integrated graphics that supports DB4A. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I've got a, another question. Yeah. Uh, related to the machine learning element of it, because um, obviously I've got a lot of contacts in console development. Mm -hmm. They've been doing. They've been working with you know temporal super sampling since you know 2015, 2016. Back in the day, yeah. 
And, you know, some of them say to me, I don't think we need machine learning to do this. Hmm. And uh, the question is, and obviously now we have FSR 2.0, yeah. which is a fully software-based solution. Absolutely. Um, well, it, well, they're all software, but this is this is basically a, a traditional-based. Uh, it's hardware yeah, accelerated. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, So I guess the question is, what does the machine learning model a actually do? Mm -hmm. What what are you know? How do you generate this this you know this neural network? Oh, okay. Well, it's a it's a pretty interesting process. I just finished a. Uh, some, some work at Stanford where I got educated on this because a couple of years ago, a, a, a wise man said, hey, AI, it's going to be big. And, and I knew really little about it, but I went and got a deep education about it. And what I, what I learned is basically it's a very simple idea. You start with a, a mass of computation that's literally, it's not random, but it might as well be. Just a bunch of uh, nodes that are doing multiplies and accumulations and then a nonlinear output transform and just connect them up in whatever random topology you want. It's not quite that stupid but similar and then take pixels and stick it on the input and then the output is your output pixels. Mm -hmm. Okay now what happens when you put the first image to, into that thing? You get uh, an image that goes in, you, guess what you get on the output? complete garbage, okay? <laughs> because it's random computation, it's just calculating stuff and you get random data. But what you do now is you take the reference image that you wish you had generated, this is during the training process, and you compare it per pixel to the output garbage that you got. And what you'll do is you'll say, the, there's an error, it should have been green, but it's white in this pixel. This pixel should have been blue, but it's red. So you calculate the delta there and you do what's called back propagation through the network. And what you're doing is you're tweaking those calculations at each node in just a tiny little bit. And then you apply a different image at the front. You propagate it all through, through this random stuff. You get a, a new random image, it's still mostly garbage. And you apply a new reference image comparison, you calculate an error, and you back propagate it all the way through the network. Do that billions of times with billions of images and billions of iterations in a supercomputer in the cloud. And at the end of the day, believe it or not, you take a random image and you put it inside in the front and guess what you get? Mm -hmm. You get an image at the end that looks pretty good. It's, it's, it's absolutely shocking. There's massive science behind it. It's the same way Google does image searching or, or you know, text searching or voice recognition, facial recognition. It's all exactly the same style of computation. It's this iteratively tweaking of these network parameters that results in somewhat this magical at the end of the day, it, it all just works. And it's trained, obviously, exclusively on game. Exclusively on games. And what's really fascinating about it is you can train it on top-down first-person shooters, and, and you can train it on like uh, third-person action or, or even chess. And somehow there's enough commonality in what makes an image a good image. Because it's, you're like, okay, uh, a good image has straight lines, not jagging lines. A good, good image has curves that make sense, and there's temporal coherence. Mm -hmm. And that's true for all games, not just a particular style of game. And that's the real challenge. It's the art. There's this whole branch of, of engineering called data scientists. And what data scientists do is they try to craft these models, and then they figure out how to get the data to train these models. And they're, you know, Amazon hires them, Google hires them, and now Intel hires them. Mm -hmm. And we're using those same people to generate our network uh, for, deep, for effectively AI applied to graphics. But you're feeding still images, right? When ideally you'd be feeding it motion? Yeah, we feed both. Uh, the right. network that we build actually takes three major components. It takes this low res resolution input image. It also takes motion vectors, uh, which is important for kind of doing a good job on dynamic objects. And it, it also takes a depth buffer. And the, and the depth buffer is very important for kind of calculating also motion. Um, it takes some masking information about how, you know, how should I interpret the, the, the uh, motion vector mask. Mm -hmm. And then it also takes prior rendered frames as an input. So you get some sort of temporal stability by factoring in these prior rendered frames. The last thing that's important is the camera that's generating the low resolution frame is jittered every other frame. So you get slightly offset images, which allows us to get sort of more more samples into the real 3D space. Mm -hmm. So um, the way I would maybe sum that up is whereas something like FSR 2.0 would have all these inputs being hand managed yep. by some sort of eyeballing and or erroring, you know, like looking at error and saying like, what would actually fix that yeah. in a general image? 
in your case, it is a, you know, these inferenced nodes on the GPU running and saying, no, the pixel should actually go there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's basically no human could describe what's happening inside that network. We know the calculations that are happening. It's not mm -hmm. like it's unknown, but, but the weights that evolve are completely opaque to humans. Mm -hmm. Where in contrast uh, with FSR2, there's a person that has to look at the output and say, you know, I think we could tweak this algorithm a little bit. And mm -hmm. they, they maybe do a little bit more blurring. They change the weights of some kind of filter. Um, and that's the fundamental difference. Uh, techniques like FSR2 are going to have things that it's really good at. It's going to have things that are not great. It might have some more shimmer or whatever. But um, a human can get in there and work on it. Mm -hmm. with, with DLSS and XCSS, it's not that simple because really it's talking about, oh, we, didn't, we did not have a complete data set that we trained on. Or our network is not big enough to encapsulate the generalization that's in this data set. So it's, much more, it's a much different skill set. It's not really a graphic a graphics algorithm engineer like you might need for a technique like FSR, it's much more of a data scientist. I need more data, I need different types of data, I need a bigger network, I need a different topology network. We don't use a, a traditional network topology. Mm -hmm. Like this is all sort of like, you know, cutting edge AI learning. Yeah. Just thinking of the chief eyeballer that <laughs> <laughs> any given developer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what it would be. So, yeah, we already talked about how it would be down maybe a few years down the line. Maybe there is some sort of generic API that plugs in via Microsoft. You know, this is a, this is a Windows thing. I would love that. Like that. That'd be great. But this currently we're using AI on the GPU for upscaling to make sure the the output frame looks better from like a like a resolution standpoint. Mm -hmm. Is that really the nth degree goal here for AI in general on the GPU? Or do you see yeah. other areas that you would like to see AI expand into? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. I, I, I am, I'm such a big fan of all things AI mm. um, that I, I see just many different places and, and a lot of the other engineers at uh, Intel see the same thing. AI is just a very good tool mm. and we can use it on things like denoising maybe, where we might just say, hey, can AI make this image look less sparkly? Can, can AI do a better job? Like sometimes people do sharpening and blurring. Should that just be an AI thing? Um, and should we maybe build that function into my super sampling algorithm? The other thing I think of is all the post effects. So post effects, that seems like a pretty obvious thing that AI could do. Um, but then you get into more interesting things like, well, geometry could be modified by AI. And if geometry is modified by AI, you could do it in ways that are transparent or, or ways that are in, you know, very visible. You could even have like a AI that has a, a, um, a stylizer of a game. Only this stylizer is not, it's turning things into, into, into marshmallows or it's turning, it's, it's a marshmallow version of the game or it's maybe a, maybe it's a, it's a everything is made out of glass version of the game. I think it's just future is unknown, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we get a question. I mean, it, we get it virtually every week on our, on our program, which is if DLSS can upscale and XESS can upscale uh, in the spatial dimension, why not do it in the temporal dimension as well? So effectively, rather, it, perhaps in addition to upscaling it, you're basically interpolating every other frame with AI. Is that, are you, is that actually a viable use case scenario? If not, why, has it, why isn't it done? Why yeah. hasn't it been done already, uh, I guess? Well, Richard, I don't, uh, let's see. First, to answer your question, I think that's a viable technology. It, so it is potentially Yeah, it's idea. a potentially viable technology. I think there's uh, interpolation, extrapolation is one of those areas that people who know me know that that's kind of like my thing. And uh, I, I have failed to deliver on that promise over decades, right? <laughs> But I still think it's a great idea. And it's hard though, because it's not as simple as just uh, uh, synthesizing a frame because there's dynamic motion in there and there's user input happening. And it's, it's pretty complex. Although uh, it seems like it should be doable. And you could probably imagine there's techniques like FSR, which would be more traditional calculations of interpolation. Mm -hmm. um, but you could, you know, obviously AI could fit right in there. And I would not limit it to one frame because the question is, well, one frame would be like doubling performances. Mm. Two frames would be sort of, well, geez, that's like 1.5x, yeah. <laughs> right? And so that would change the world. If you could do a good job of interpolation for 60 milliseconds, that's gonna be incredible. 
Um, but right now that technology has just not gotten over the finish line. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a viable concept. Well, I, I, don't, I shouldn't say that so confidently. I think it's a viable concept. Okay. Would it require yeah. the CPU to run at full rate and just... Again, it's, it's really unknown. I think the CPU is, is uh, CPU GPU balance in an interpolated frame is interesting. I think it's probably going to actually shift the workload slightly towards the CPU. Because yeah, well, that's happening now already, right? If, yeah. if, you know, basically, if your performance level is going up, yeah. it increases the strain on the, the CPU to, to generate the yeah. commands to yeah. the GPU. It's true. And, and I think interpolation or extrapolation would change all of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank God you make CPUs. As well. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. Um, that's about it for XESS questions I have, essentially. Although, I mean, there's some other things in here, mainly about how things are handled in XESS, because, uh, for example, one thing I've noticed when looking at the difference between FSR 2.0 and DLSS 2, and it's like one of the core differences that the videos I've made have focused on, because it's like one, it's like one of the large ones was that essentially when an object is disocluded, as in something moves in front of a background and the background is re-revealed, uh, DLSS and XES uh, or, or an FSR 2.0 have different resolves of that. DLSS tends to be more stable mm -hmm. and anti-aliased. Do you know how XESS handles something like that or why it would handle it differently? Because I've looked at XESS a little bit here now and I've noticed more DLSS-like behavior. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's just a as a result of the way the neural net is modeled or if it's actually some other aspect of the pipeline there? It's hard to say until we really look at the specifics that you're seeing, but mm -hmm. in general, I would expect that uh, XESS is gonna have good temporal stability, meaning, meaning that as things de-occlude or disocclude, you can still see a good background. And it's because there's lots of feedback mm -hmm. uh, and it's temporal feedback. So prior rendered frames, are turned around and fed back into the network to generate the current frame. So you might see, and plus there's jittering. So mm -hmm. as you jitter the camera and you feed back in prior rendered frames, that gives you uh, temporal stability. Mm -hmm. So I, I suspect you might see some of that. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess we just want to close out by talking about long-term objectives because uh, we've got a pretty good idea of the stack now, certainly at the top and the bottom. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got some performance numbers to be verified. Um, with the uh, seven, 750 and um, the comparison is with the 3060 so yeah. you know we don't need to talk about specific performance numbers but if the 750 is the cut down G10 die we should expect a bump more for the 770 yeah for the 770 but you're still some way off the you know the, the absolute top end performers mm -hmm. right that's that's fairly clear you must be aiming for that top end at some point, right? Some point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 The way to think about it is the, the full stack is a, a strong desire of Intel, n not just on the discrete GPU business side, which which it is, but also in the server space, in the data center, and right. and, and and even having more efficient GPUs for the client space. So think of it as our investment in GPU science and GPU architectures and GPU drivers is huge and it's big because it's not just about the client or, or the data center or discrete business, it's all of it. And uh, I, I, I suspect we're, on the, we're at the very beginning of a you know, multi-year journey as our driver gets better and better, our hardware gets better and better, you'll see us enter a full stack competition with the leaders in the space. Mm -hmm. Okay, but why limit to 32 XE cores this time around? You know, we, we have just, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you how, how much we've learned so far. Okay. Right, and I, I, I almost say that the question is, why did we do so much this first round, not why didn't we do more? You know, I, I almost say, I wish we had done less so that we could get done out sooner. But it's, it's a balance, right? We're all trying to figure this out as we go. And the, the original decisions that we made, I guess it was now three years ago, about our chip lineup kind of made, made sense at the time. Right now, I'm pretty happy with where we are because it gives us a good vehicle to get some learning under our belt, right? right. Mm -hmm. and, and after we get that learning under our belt, I think we'll be in a much better position in Battle Mage. And obviously after that, Celestial and Druid. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent stuff. 
Um, I guess that's all I've got. Any further questions? No, <laughs> yeah. my lord. You, you preempted this last question earlier in this discussion when you said, like, oh, we're in it for the long haul. We you are. Can tell, you know, yeah. This is a multi, it's more than five years. Now, it's so. definitely more than five years. Yeah, so. And, and the cool thing about it is it's going to benefit everybody, right? There's going to be a strong third competitor in the graphics space. Mm. And that competition is going to lead to a lot of good things that we all know, right? Better performance better experiences, better power efficiency, mm -hmm. new technologies, and overall sort of more equitable, hopefully, you know, uh, consumer facing pricing. All right. Well, last question for me. This is this, obviously there's no guarantee that this will get a good answer, but Tom's wish list for the Intel driver in the future. What are some things you'd love to see in the Intel driver? Ooh, Intel in the next, driver. Let's say like the next five years. No, ne no, next five years. No promises. No promises next five what years. What would you like in there? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Well, I, I want continued uh, game compatibility. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing that everybody wants at Intel is to say, hey, there's a catalog of 10,000 games that are out there. Let's make them all run perfectly. Mm -hmm. That's going to take a long time. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing I'd like to see is can we do a better job of helping people with settings? Because right now, settings are just rocket science to most people, and, and most people don't touch them if you look at the statistics. So what would it take for us to not do anything like uh, optimized game settings, which is the GeForce Experience approach, but actually take a little bit more of a performance-driven approach where we can provide some kind of advisor uh, based on your hardware, your platform, and monitoring your game experience. And I did share a little graph uh, at Gamer Nexus. I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but it was like this. I showed uh, GPU, CPU breakdown per frame. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, hey, can we gain some insight by looking at that? What's the load on the CPU? What's the load on the GPU? What do the timestamps look like? And can we then give feedback to the user based on that and, and, and have them learn something? So maybe you got... Maybe you've got your resolution too high for your, for your current performance. Maybe you've got the textures too big. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe if you turned off ambient occlusion, you get better performance. So all that kind of stuff, I'd love to be a driver or, or maybe even a layer above the driver. So lots of ideas like that. But right now, I want to get performance and I want to get compatibility and all the bells and whistles after that. That's all after that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really like the idea of the GPU being able to tell you that your CPU limited, therefore. Yeah. But there is sort of an interesting uh, scenario here where you've got Intel telling people to buy a new CPU. <laughs> uh, you know, there's so many interesting things about this, and we haven't even touched on this, Richard, but like with a CPU and a GPU tightly integrated together, um, certainly in a power constrained platform, there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. and, and then once you start thinking about that, it's like, is there really a CPU and a GPU anymore? It's really just compute units that are executing multiple different streams of instructions. What's, what's up with that? Like, why are we doing that? And so as you start really dis you know, kind of stepping away from the whole problem and looking at it with a CPU and a GPU, um, what do you do? Mm. There's lots, lots that you could change there. Oh gosh, I just thought of another question, unfortunately. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the question is this, uh, there are some interesting features already in the control panel, and one oh. of the ones which intrigued us yeah. was, uh, was it soft sync? Smooth, 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 smooth sync. Smooth sync, yeah. yeah, which is an interesting uh, effect whereby with vSync off, obviously, you get ugly tearing, which I can't abide. Yeah, I, I, I cannot abide. I cannot, I cannot <laughs> look at it. Cannot abide. <laughs> but you've got an interesting situation here where you have a feature which effectively blurs the, the tear line. Yeah. Right. And it, obviously, it's not going to remove the kind of wobbling effect right. on panning it's motion. It's not magic. It's not magic. But it does do something positive to the presentation. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious as to how it works, because yeah. if you think about why we have a tear line, it's because you're flipping the, the frame buffer mid-refresh, yeah, right? Yeah. But to blur the line, presumably you would need to be doing some sort of post-process on the output, but the output is mid-scan out. I right. don't, I don't right. understand how you do well, it. Well, if you think about it, there's a region of about 10 scan lines where this blur mm -hmm. is happening. Okay, and, and to think about that, you need to have both frames available, both the new one and the old one when you're doing that blur. So what this means is you're going to delay the writing of the old frame a little bit right. so that you can wait for the new frame so that in the case where you flip, you can blur it. Mm -hmm. okay. right? Or you could 
You could think about it the other way and say, don't delay the old frame at all, but when you get a new frame, wait for 10 frames before you start showing the new frame, at, or 10, 10 scan lines. And what we'll do is we'll be blending with the old right. one and the new one, right? Okay. And it's all done in our display engine. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so think of it as it's, it's, very, it's software transparent, mm -hmm. nobody knows it's on, there has nothing to do with Windows, and it just does this idea of dithering between old and new when a new frame is completed. Okay, that makes sense because I was thinking that you were blurring both the previous frame and the old and the new frame, which would incur latency. No, it doesn't. So yeah, I think that would be bad, right? Yeah. So the way it actually works is we rent, we've rendered an old frame, we're scanning it out, and we'll just keep scanning it normally. But then a new frame is rendered. So now instead of flipping to it, we'll start blending on top of the old frame. Mm -hmm. So that old frame lives around for a few more scan lines, and then you know we're done and we let it go. It's interesting. Interestingly enough, there's older 2D cards back in the 90s that would do something similar. I didn't know this. But it, it, I think it was might have been accidental just because of how, <laughs> just because you know, how jank the, yes. you know, how how janky janky the janky it was, was. Uh, back then. But I've, I've recorded old 2D cards that do that. I'd like to see that. Yeah, um, I can send you a, a quake screen of it. That'd be cool. My last question that I could really think of was, uh, since we did talk about forward-looking features, um, one thing that's on the roadmap from Microsoft, and it still hasn't had a release yet, is direct storage GPU decompression. Yes. What is Intel doing in this space? Like, I don't know if you can announce anything like that. Of I course, can't but, announce anything like that, but, but I can I, say that it's a great idea. Okay. Right? <laughs> and, do, you know, doing GPU accelerated uh, in compression and decompression helps with me large media assets, which is games, right? Yeah. So we definitely will be. Uh, you know, excited to see a standard from Microsoft that we can adopt and plug in a compatible codec okay. uh, that, that we would hardware accelerate. Okay. And I think, I think the question is, how do you do this in a way that works across the whole industry? And it can't be a codec that is particularly tuned for one vendor. It has to be something that works well for everybody's uh, GPU. So you would imagine in this theoretical future that each vendor has their own, everyone's using direct storage, but the actual Decompression is different per. I, I GPU think that's. Driver? I think that's very difficult. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It could. I mean, that would be perfect if that yeah. would be if that was a thing. But I don't think that's a thing because the media has to be encoded to already in the game a specific yeah. format, right? Yeah. So if you have a specific format that has to be encoded, that kind of defines what the codec, you know, the decoder is mm. going to be. And so we all have to agree on what that decoder is. Because if we don't all agree, then some people are going to have good experiences and other people are going to have bad experiences. All right, and maybe a okay a little addendum to that question would be <laughs> so you Intel has GPUs and CPUs right next to each other. You just mentioned how they're blending, how they could blend. Well, yeah, or you know, like things like that. One of the aspects of PC architecture that is a legacy, but a you know, it's an important one, is the split between your system RAM pool and your video RAM pool. Yeah. Uh, direct storage at some point in the future wants to maybe go around that. I don't know if you've got, you know, read yeah. into it at all, you yeah. know, like I, instead I, of, you know, copying first to system RAM and then going to VRAM. You maybe like, just decode into... Just decoding is, straight from disk into VRAM. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that. I, I don't have... <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not the, oh, I'm not the technical right. expert on that, oh, but right. I yeah. can tell you that our architects are working on that. Yeah. And I, I have confidence that, I mean, that's the obvious end goal. Right? Yeah. We want to be able to directly write VRAM, mm -hmm. and uh, that matches what happens with other decoding and other encoding using the GPU. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if, you're, if, if all things come, if the planets align, <laughs> it should work out. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, it's been a fascinating discussion. I've yeah, really Richard, it's it. great to see. I can't believe it's been a year. Absolutely, yeah. Goddamn COVID. Since that Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we haven't actually physically seen each other since 2018. Oh my God, that was crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. But exciting times ahead. Yeah. Um, a, a new player in the GPU market. Your performance reviews are going to become mm -hmm. even more even worse. time consuming. <sighs> but I really want to see your XCSS like quality comparison. The reason I'm so excited to be with you guys today is because of that review. I really want to see it. No, so I I'm looking forward. Expectations. Yeah. No, no, well, my expectations are it is what it is. All right. Right? So I, I, I'm pretty feeling pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, want, I want you guys to uh, help, help educate me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank yeah. you. That's quite the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks, you got it. Okay, well, thanks so much for joining us. It's yeah. been a pleasure. It's been an absolute joy to, to talk about everything that's gone on in the last year and to look ahead to, to, the, to the products to come. The card looks 
looks uh, really, really nice. I'm pretty yeah. happy with it. Uh -huh. So um, we will be reviewing that at some point. Yes, um, with me covering XCSS in maybe a number of titles, but focusing on one for sure. Uh, looking at the exact same way I've done it with FSR 2.0 recently, so look out for that. And ray tracing, of course. And ray tracing, ray tracing of course. Oh my god, that's a whole other thing. Look at here. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of here. You got, but there's a new player. Time. There's a new player here. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, blue team here. Well, that's, that's all we have for now. Uh, please do like, subscribe, share if you enjoyed the content. Ring the bell for those notionally instant notifications. No guarantees there. You may or may not get a notification. That is my disclaimer. <laughs> And uh, DF Supporter Program, um, join us. Mm -hmm. Join our amazing community. High quality video downloads, everything we do. Tons of bonus material, possibly mm -hmm. some XESS. For bonus sure. Material. Definitely. Let's see. Um, but that's all from us for now. Thanks for liking. Uh, for watching. <laughs> but that's all from us for now. From Thanks for, for from, watching. From Berlin. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Uh,